Uh, thanks for coming around, and uh, we're very proud and privileged to have Ed Carlton here give us a talk on Dash's latest human powered aircraft. Uh, this will be followed almost immediately by um, uh, Bob Bickers giving the, the next briefing. Okay, that's it. Hello. <laughs> Um, I was here last year and gave a progress update on Dash, and at the time we just um, we just built the tail sections. Was about all the real parts we built. We've done a lot of prep work, a lot of testing. Um, now we basically have the airplane finished. So, I, except for about a dozen slides from before, I blew those all away, and it's mostly just going to be uh, construction photos and just talking about building the airplane um, up to this point. But I'm also going to talk a little bit about, very briefly, about our Dash Voltaire. And the, um, everybody's been asking me about what the other airplanes are in the US. And so there's uh, one being built at University of California, Irvine. So I just have a couple slides on that. Then I'll go over Dash, the specs, did we meet them? And then just a bunch of photos of construction details. So first, uh, if you guys remember, right before I rushed off to the airport in the middle of the rally last year, uh, we held this little design discussion. I wanted to go back to some sort of really simple kind of human-powered airplane where you just try to get a bunch of wing area up there and build something really quickly. And we immediately got to, to about 10 different designs because there was 10 different people in the room. But my idea was to try to build something sort of closer to the Gossamer Condor made out of aluminum, something that somebody could build in their backyard that didn't involve a lot of complicated composites and things like that. And the problem with make, making something out of aluminum is the available aluminum tubes that you can buy are way too heavy for the diameters that you need. And what they did back then was they did really nasty stuff with acid and making this you know, slurry, rotating the tube around until it got as thin as they wanted. So I decided to try starting with um, uh, sheet metal aluminum, which you can get in the, in the thicknesses you want, depending on where you are on the wing, from 32 thousandths thick to, of an inch to uh, 16 thousandths. So we did some experiments. The idea was we were going to actually try to prefab a bunch of parts and ship them over here and build the airplane before the rally this year. But uh, we were behind on Dash, and it just didn't quite happen. Um, so we did some experiments on making circular spars out of stuff. The, the, the wing design that I came up with is what I call a bird-like airfoil. The front half is double surface, and the back half is just a flat plate. So we did a bunch of work on making lightweight flat plates out of very, very thin foam with very, very light fiberglass that was then going to get supported by aluminum poles in the back. I got that idea by looking at some of the planes here last year that had used very, very thin um, foam with fiberglass in part of their construction. Uh, and then we went to a, a rectangular spar as well, which is two um, identical rectangular pieces with flanges on them that meet together. And then we put some foam in the middle and use a, a glue to glue them together. So. This all was kind of working, we just ran out of time. So it's something I want to explore in the future. So maybe next year there'll be an aluminum airplane flying around. Um, and then this is a, I don't know, 12 or 15 foot spar uh, gluing up. Um, let me talk briefly about Voltaire. So we had two projects going on for this rally. Uh, one was R-Dash that we were trying to get done, didn't happen. The other was Voltaire, which as you all probably know, Will Stoney rescued from the uh, fate of the rubbish heap, the Bang Goes the Theory air airplane from 2012, and um, it kind of flew in 2012. I don't know how many, how many of you guys saw the TV program. Yeah. So it kind of hopped a few times, but never really controlled flight. Um, I did some analysis, and uh, because it's a, a very small wing area, short wingspan airplane, it flies fast, and so having an unfaired pilot really has a an even bigger effect than it would on some of the other airplanes that are flying successfully out here uh, this week. And so, for example, with a 75 kilogram pilot, it's roughly about 600 watts would be required. And if you know anything about the human powered curve, that's we're talking like five to 15 seconds, you can put that out. Actually, Greg did really well. I don't know if Greg's here. Are you here, Greg? He put out an average of about 20 on, on the one that we measured uh, was the next to the last fl flight attempt or the last flight attempt. Um, so he, he put out 600 watts for about, um, about 20 seconds, but that's about as long as you can do that. If you put a fairing on it, that drops that down to that same weight pilot down to about 400 watts, the hope being that maybe you could fly for a minute or two and you know, do several hundred meters. So 
Um, this was the airplane at the start. There was a bunch of delaminations on the wing sections and uh, all of the tail supports were, were damaged and been sort of patched quickly to try to get the thing working. But um, in general, it was actually in pretty good shape except for that. So we uh, took one of the ribs from the dash fuselage, which I'll show in a little while, um, which was the right size. Because of the upright pilot position, we couldn't make sort of a, a tapered fuselage like Air Glow and Aerocycle and um, Betterfly and everybody have. We, we had to sort of make a 2D fuselage that was just the same rib over and over so that the pilot would fit in between. So we just made a bunch of copies of those ribs with balsa wood laminations, 1 16th inch thick, four of them for a quarter inch cross section and then used um, very lightweight carbon fiber tape to, to strengthen it. And in the end, this is what we came up with. We had to leave a pretty big gap in the middle for um, the door on the other side for the pilot to get in. And we also couldn't really round the bottom because the pedals were very low to the ground. So there was no room to try to smooth out the bottom, but it actually came out pretty nice. But the mistake I made was, you know, this was kind of sticking your thumb up engineering is this is a little bit too far forward. So we think it, it might've been a little bit destabilizing uh, and we don't know how much control authority we have. I don't think we've, e nobody has ever known how much control authority Voltaire's had because it didn't really have controlled flight before. So we did fly five flight attempts on Sunday, um, dialing, trying to dial in the elevator and, um, uh, and then we got the proper prop, prop pitch in. At first we didn't have enough pitch and we were, weren't able to put up enough power. And then we did one on Thursday. I'm, I'm, the days are blurring now. <laughs> Anyway, uh, and we had figured the wind had gotten progressively higher on Sunday and it was getting better and better because this flies so fast, you don't have to accelerate too much to fly. So you want some wind, but we tried in, you know, near nil wind. And then this is the reason and I'll go into this in a video in a little bit more why an upright pilot position isn't a great idea. My original sketches for, for dash were an upright pilot position. I figured Gossamer Albatross did it. Why can't we? But I was dissuaded by Bob Parks of the Daedalus team, who's been advising on Dash, that you really want to have the CG way down low so this doesn't happen. And we just happened to hit a muddy patch, and it's amazing how quick it went over. And I'll show you the video in a minute. Uh, last thing was the, t before getting into Dash was the UC Irvine machine. So they've been building this. They started a, uh, around the same time as me and didn't really start building parts until uh, about the same time we did, a cu couple years into their project a couple years ago. The original uh, students that um, started the project have now gone to either graduate school or industry. One of them is working at um, Scaled Composites. They made some really nice molds for their props. They made some, uh, you'll see the, the plug and mold for the fuselage, but they have a weight problem. They, these things are really, really beefy. And the wings were actually pretty nice, but the, their tail s surfaces were, were very heavy. So I've, I've gone down and advised them a few times. They're, the new team is now rethinking things, and they may go back to more of an um, a, a underslung fuselage frame instead of this sailplane-like fuselage that wor they worked on before. They had a sailplane-like fuselage, the idea being, oh, it's going to be really sleek and low drag, but they didn't ever really totally work out what they were going to do about the fact that the prop was going to be hitting the ground if they got low. So, and, and I, I don't know if they ever came up with like a mechanism to stop it, you know, based on certain height or whatever. Um, it's a little hard to see in here, but it's a, it's a really nice fuselage design. If you look up UCI HPA, you can see some of their, their images and stuff about what so the, the fuselage. So this, this, this is the plug. Um, it may be upside down. I'm not sure. Yeah, probably is upside down. This is the plug and this is, I guess, the upper half of the mold, not the bottom half of the mold with the split line and there's another piece like this. They got this all nice and done but by the guy who is now gone who, who's really good at composites. He's also the one that made their really nice propeller blade. And then um, they built one of the two mold halves and then the, the OSHA people, the, the health and safety people on the campus shut them down and d won't let them finish. But I think they, they also, you know, based on feedback from me and other people realize that this is probably not viable. So I think what they're looking to do is take their wings, which are a little heavy, but not bad, and sort of re rethink and redesign the rest of the airplane. Um, okay, on to Dash. So I've got a few slides from last time and a bunch of new slides. Why do we do it? Just for the fun of it, basically. Um, I think that's why we're all doing it. Um, I started it when I was working at Google and I started the Google workshop. So we um, were 
building it first in the Google workshops and then in a series of Google, Google buildings that they just sort of been acquiring um, buildings all around Mountain View. So we, um, so we, uh, they let us sort of hop from building to building that were, was not ready to be refurbished yet and work out of those uh, until this last November when I finally had to rent a place to, as we're finishing it off. Um, design considerations, just very briefly, I wanted to make it low design and build time, which is pretty funny because we're just a few months away from five years into the project. Uh, <laughs> I want to design it to, for field assembly and transport. I, I, I remembered that Daedalus, which was 1.7, 1.75 G design, broke at the very end of the flight. And I wanted to, to make it stronger. So I designed it for 2.5 Gs. And actually, we're deflection limited on the spars. So the spars are even quite a bit stronger than that not, um, in terms of stress limit. The thing that will break first on our plane is, this, is the lift wire, not the spars. And I'm, I've really been impressing everybody's planes when they ground loop, including Voltaire. You know, the wing bends and everything, but really there's not that much damage. It, best thing you can do is just sort of let it ground loop and, and you know, do its thing. Um, anyway, for, don't worry about the rest of that stuff. I created this spreadsheet that started out with four cells and turned into this gigantic thing. This is the spreadsheet I used, you know, for Voltaire to put in its, its um, specifications to figure out what the approximate weight be. I've, I've taken stats from some of your airplanes and from a bunch of existing HPA designs, and it always seems to agree within about 5% or so of what the stated values were. So I think it's a relatively accurate uh, model. So uh, these slides I talked about before, but I'm just going to say it one more time. Dash is a huge airplane. Um, we have versions from 33.3 meters to 40 meter wingspan. And I think probably the biggest wingspan here I'm Guessing I didn't ever get an exact spec, but it's something like 26 or 28 meters for yeah, the, the, the super, super tips, tips on, on the 30. 30? Okay, so you're getting, getting up there um, for the aeroglow with the, the longer tips. Um, if you take that spreadsheet that I did and you run the analysis, and, and this includes, I'm not sure if these ones include, yeah, these include the, the mass varying as the, as the spar gets, uh, as the plane gets bigger. Um, you see that, first of all, it's pretty insensitive to aspect ratio, which is interesting, and, and, um, and surface area, which are you know, tied together when you're talking about span changing. And you pretty much have to be in the mid-30s before things kind of flatten out and you don't get much more benefit of having a bigger wingspan. So I, I created the first version of Dash, the 33.3 meter version, just by typing the numbers in before I made this graph, and I came up with 33.3 meters. Daedalus was 34. Um, and then I said, I know I'm probably going to have you know, more induced drag than I want, so let's make some even bigger wingtips. So I made some extensions to make a 37 meter version, and then I made some longer outer sections with extensions on top of that to make a 40 meter version. So we've got three versions sort of in here. This is, rather than watts per kilogram, this is for, a, for the max weight pilot of uh, of 90 kilograms. The top line is, is, is a low speed, is it? Uh, this, th these are, these are, this is varying by surface area. Of, so this is effectively it's surface area or aspect ratio. Think of it either way. This is a really low aspect ratio, and then this is a high aspect ratio, and it actually it doesn't pay off to go up above some certain aspect, aspect ratio. ratio. It's much more span, span dependent than aspect, aspect ratio dependent. Do you assume ground effect? Uh, no, and I'm I always uh, don't think about ground effect because based on the results of the Gossamer team and also the Daedalus team, they, they found that there was sort of this inverse ground effect, particularly over choppy water, but even over, like, any time the wind comes up, they, they found that it was going up. I'm, we're putting a power meter in Dash, and, I'm, and you guys have started to do that, too. I'm really interested to see if we can do... I mean, the, the, the data is going to be so ratty, I don't know if we'll ever be able to, to pull, tease it out, but I'm really interested to see if, if it varies at all or if it is the typical ground effect or if, it's, if we ever see any evidence of this sort of inverse ground effect as the wind comes up, it actually gets worse down low with these really low wing loading airplanes. Um, this is just showing that, that it's pretty insensitive to aspect ratio once the aspect ratio starts to become something reasonable. Okay, so why we went to recumbent? Uh, for Dash. This is the video that I was promising. So this is our flight yesterday morning. I'm, is that right? <laughs> flight attempt. And 
This was in, I don't know, just a couple miles an hour of wind. We really probably needed about eight or 10 miles an hour to accelerate up. And uh, I think this is the right one. Yeah. Start to veer off. Looks like it's just gonna be a normal ground loop situation. We, we went over grass about four out of the five times on Sunday. Oh, I think that was really the small wheel dug in. Yeah, this, there was a muddy area just, just inside where the runway is where all the water dumps off and it got caught in the mud. You could see the, the deep scar and then it just, it just stuck and, and went over. Also your front wheel is actually almost an inch to the end of the pilot, whereas a lot of our front wheels are a little, a little, little bit farther forward. Yeah. But anyway, as regards to dash, we can talk about that more later and watch it more if anybody wants to see it. Um, I, my original sketches for Dash were with an upright pilot, and Bob Parks said, no, 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 you want to be recumbent, and here's why. And, you know, structurally, it's better to just have your butt right by the, the main landing wheel. You don't have to have a bunch of extra structure. And the, the other thing was a safety thing, this tipping um, problem that uprights can have. Um, so I took his advice, and I'm glad I did. Uh, but for, for Voltaire, you know, Will considered switching it to recumbent and I said that would probably be a good idea long term but I just don't think we can build something that quick in the three weeks or whatever we have before the rally so and I think that was true I mean we just barely got the fairing done in time so um, it's we were just sort of stuck with what you know what had been built before uh, now I can't remember where I was uh, somewhere around here yeah So when we started out Dash, we were, did a bunch of, um, this was sort of our three-view drawing for a while. We, we designed all the tubes and finite element analysis and SolidWorks before we actually had a SolidWorks solid model of the plane. Eventually, we got a solid model. This is not the latest version. I just didn't pull one off that's the latest version, but it's basically the right idea. It's sort of a close-up of the fuselage frame. Um, the original intention was to have, like Aeroglow and Aerocycle, a, a Kevlar carbon fiber tub here and then the rest would be a few um, ribs. But um, making that plug and mold and everything was going to be the hardest part of the whole thing. And after five years, I'm kind of anxious to get flying. So you'll see the last slides I show are we, we ended up doing something that's building a bunch of formers and making the whole thing out of balsa wood. We may use a little Depron in there, but mostly it's going to be covered with Mylar. Uh, design specs, the main thing I want to talk about here is that what the original targets were. We designed for a 90 kilogram pilot, 2.5 G's. Um, that's for the 33.3 meter version of the airplane. It's a little bit less for the bigger ones, but although, like I said, it's just the lift wire that's actually going to meet that. The wing is quite a bit stronger. Um, we were going for a 36.3 kilogram airplane weight, and we finally got everything all added together you know, all but a, the last couple hundred grams of the plane are built now, and it's about 44 and a half kilograms, so about 99 pounds. So we're over by about 20 percent. It's interesting. We had lunch with the Aerovelo guys that did the human-powered helicopter, won the Sikorsky Prize, and they said on Snowbird and on on the helicopter, they their professor had said you always want to build in a 20 percent or 25 percent <laughs> weight overage, um, and that's kind of what we came in in at. So I know. How to build it lighter, we, we took some decisions like using pink foam for the ribs instead of white foam that cost us a little weight. And then we ran into a problem. Our original idea was to take mylar and cover the entire surface. But since we were using Depron for the leading edge, we found we could not heat shrink the mylar without completely warping the Depron. So now I've got some techniques um, on, on uh, Voltaire. We use the polyolefin, which heat shrinks at a much lower temperature. So you can easily go over Depron without distorting its shape. We could, could do that. Um, or there's very low temperature um, adhesive backed films that we could put over. I, I looked at that, some of that with UCI to try to solve some of their problems. But um, what we did is we took an adhesive backed mylar that's two thousandths of an inch thick. So that added several kilograms to the airplane um, to cover the Depron, th thinking that we're not really going to get laminar flow if we had the slightly bumpy surface of Depron. Maybe that was a mistake. You'll see some some flow vis stuff that we did based on that. Anyway, this is the airplane as it is designed. The white is the 33.3 meter. The 
orange is f just under 37 meters if we put a wingtip extension on this wingtip, or we have a longer outer wingtip that goes to the end of the red, and then um, the blue is wingtip extensions on that. So this is 33, 37, and 40 meters, basically. And this gives you an idea just of the 33 meter version, how big that is. Um, and I don't know, I left the slide in just to show we actually did do finite element analysis on it. Uh, so we d we've done a bunch of testing and I'll have some more slides of this, but we back in October, November, October, end of, end of October, we went to the Hiller Museum. It was a really great place to do this. There's all these you know, models of airplanes there. The only place we could find that had a big enough interior space that would, would let us do this. So we sort of became a live exhibit for the Hiller Museum. And you know, we did the typical thing, weighting it with the bottles to give the right weight, first for 1G to get the lift wire length dialed in, then at 1.5G um, to you know, prove that it's not going to break at 1.1Gs, but we're not, we weren't gonna, intending to go up to 2.5. Um, so we did that on the, uh, I'll go into more detail when we get to the other slides. We also did a similar thing for our uh, spar uh, for the prop. And we did testing of people too to try to see, you know, who can fly this thing and how long they can fly it. Um, we got the typical human powered curve here. Uh, this is in watts per kilogram. I think uh, now that we're heavier, we're, real, we're up more like 3.5, 3.6 watts per kilogram, not 3.3. But um, you can see that we have some pilots, uh, Greg is one of them, and um, Craig and a few other people who are well above four, so they should be able to fly this thing for reasonably long as long as they don't exhaust themselves in the taking off process. Um, okay, so now this is just a bunch of photos of stuff that you haven't seen since the last time I gave a presentation here. Uh, except for these, these first three photos. <laughs> so these are the last photos from last time. All, the only real part of the airplane that we had built when I was here last time was the tail se sections. So you've seen these photos before. Um, and uh, we, we kept these constant cord just as a way to save time. Um, so we'd just bang out one rib over and over. Uh, that's just showing the biggest and smallest cord on the wing, and then we started building the actual wings and, um, before we'd only built uh, test sections. So this is just some pictures of putting together the wings. We used all the shucks that we cut it out from to support the wings while we glued it. We have washout in the last, um, I'm forgetting now, a couple meters of the wing. And so we dialed that in by carefully positioning those. Carbon fiber rear spar, it's pretty light when it's all together. Um, then we got ready for that load test. We made up a, a bunch of lift wires. I don't think I have, it to, oh yeah, we stretched the lift wires. When they come in a box, they're coiled up really tight. So we actually, um, actually stretch them out so they end up coiling up like this and they're much easier to unloop and handle. When they're really tight, they get all tangled up with themselves. I found out later that my truck, I thought was rated to 3,500 towing pound towing capacity was only 2,000 pounds. So I also damaged my truck doing this. Um, so this so shows you what it's like out of the box, and this shows you what it's like after you've done that slight yielding of the thing. And the, these sailing thimbles that we have wrapped up with uh, copper wire and silver solder, they can take that full load that, uh, you know, up to and beyond yield, but they do get distorted. So then we do this on a longer piece, and then we chop them off and then put, the, uh, put another one on for the final length. Interestingly, Alex, we, um, when we get our cables for our winch out in the gliding field, yeah. we put the winch at one end, having rolled it all onto the drum, take it out as far as we can, and then we pull a vehicle in with it, yeah, and that stretches it enough to make it a handleable cable there yeah. after. So we, we found exactly the same. Similar thing. Yeah, it was really interesting doing those pulls because we had the full brake on the car, and <laughs> we, we got up to the point where it was actually just pulling the car along. <laughs> so, uh, all right, so this is cutting up the bits to make, um, to make those ribs. We made our ribs the same way I showed with Voltaire. We'll probably have some more pictures of that here. We set up this whole laser system to cut the holes um, through the ribs for our Kevlar cross bracing that we used. And then we had a lot of cross bracing. Uh, several of the people here that are from Dash participated in that, did a lot of it. Um, after the accident that I'm going to show you in a bit, 
we had to redo it on all the wing sections. So we got a lot of experience doing it. And in addition to building the five wing sections that make up the base airplane, we built an extra set of wing tips for the base airplane and the longer set of wing tips. So we have almost two planes worth of wing sections built. So we had a lot of wing construction going on, which is why it's taken us a while. Um, we used Depron for the leading edge, which I think was a good idea, except for this difficulty of, of, uh, form of tightening mylar over it. We keep a gap between sections that we cover up with tape, and then we have two aluminum pieces, I may have a picture of it, um, that are used to prevent you know, the wings from coming apart, but obviously most of the force is taken up. We've got sleeving inside here. It's about two and a half um, diameters of the spar that's taking most of the load. And yeah, that's what it looks like. So those are, those are uh, orange things are shims, but there's a little 7075 aluminum pin that goes into these other pieces. And those are glued into the rear spars and the, and the front support pieces. We silver soldered and then Kevlar wrapped the uh, larger, I think, 100,000 diameter steel um, music wire for, for our fitting for the lift wire. And then the lift wire itself is 80,000. So that's just showing that process. And then we had a bunch of kids spent several days getting all the water bo bottles filled up and marked. So for the, you know, basically, we had four tests we wanted to do for the 33 meter version of the plane and the 40 meter version. 1G and 1.5G. So there was a lot of different marks they had to put on there and accurately do it. We got all those bottles from a recycling center. Then we loaded it all up into a truck that we rented, put it together. Whoops. So this is a little animation that Google Photos made. Um, and then we started doing the test. And at first our lift wire was a little too slack or a little too tight. So then we added another link in there, another um, carabiner. And it was a little too loose, and then we had our equation to figure out the, the right thing. And then we loaded it up to 1.5 Gs. It's a little dark. It's better on the computer, but it's kind of a cool view down the wing. Um, and then we stopped for the day. The forklift that we had had this problem where as we were doing the test, the forks were slowly going like this because it had a hydraulic leak, and we'd noticed that. And so when we got the wing all down and rested it for the day and we're going to come back the next day and test the longer wing, we didn't want to park the forklift right over it and have them crush the middle of the wing. So um, we untied the safety cord we had and backed the forklift away from the wing. And the safety cord was because we had a one-point system for lifting it. We didn't have two points because we wanted to sort of simulate the way it was really being suspended and not have an artificial torque put in there. Um, but what that meant is that on this aluminum pseudo fuselage thing here, it was just the friction of that tube that was holding the whole thing from rotating. And we had the safety cord tied from here to here that was gonna prevent it from rotating away. And we took it away and then the next day I was like, well, that worked so well and didn't move, I'm not going to tie the cord back on. And let's see, I've got, these are a little bit out of, out of sequence. This is the, longest version now with the extensions on there. You can see the wingtip extension and then this is an 8.5 meter <laughs> one. Um, anyway, so what happened was we got the behemoth version up, up for load. It was up there for 20, 25 minutes. I went upstairs to take pictures from up, uh, up in, on the stairs, took a couple pictures, came back down. Uh, they're all, everybody's standing around looking at it. We'd taken a bunch of deflection measurements just about to put it back down, I came downstairs and that's what I found. Um, so what happened was it basically broke the ribs at the back, uh, every rib and this um, <coughs> central support tube that the wing mounts are tied to on the center section. The middle section was relatively undamaged and then the outer section where the tips hit, they really unzipped and a bunch of pieces on the, on the ground. So it was pretty depressing. Uh, one thing to note is it would have been really depressing except that it didn't quite rotate symmetrically and this piece hit on the corner of the fork and stuck. And if that hadn't happened, this thing would have flipped all the way around like more than 180 and completely ripped the whole wing apart. That saved us because, you know, this is pretty bad. A bunch of ribs ripped apart, but it actually, you know, after we kind of recovered from the fact that it happened, was really easy to fix. Um, 
And it basically was just like a jigsaw puzzle piece. These didn't even have any separate pieces. The wingtips where a bunch of pieces broke, it was a little bit more challenging. But we just had to, you know, glue these back together, gusset it with a little bit of balsa wood and also a little bit of um, very thin plywood on, on the tops and bottoms. And um, probably added on the outer wings, maybe like 20 or 30 grams to each wing. And on the inner one where we had to strengthen the um, center section, maybe 50 grams, but it didn't really add very much weight to fix it. And it only took about a day for each wing section. <laughs> we built a custom trailer, which in the end was a big, big mistake. Um, you can buy a 28 foot race car trailer for about $7,000 in the US. And I spent more than twice that building our own custom trailer <laughs> that actually doesn't fit the, it only fits the wing sections and tail sections. It doesn't fit the um, fuselage. So we have to have an extra truck for that. So. This is a project in and its of itself, and it was a good learning experience, but I wouldn't do it again. Um, I've got a couple more pictures of that. Uh, so then we had to move in November into a new space in San Jose that we're renting. Google's finally so huge and needs space so bad they couldn't loan us buildings anymore. Um, these are a little bit jumbled, so I apologize for that. But um, we have several, we have, I think, six or seven people who are above that, you know, four watt per kilogram level for long periods of time. Um, but only one of them, Greg, is actually a pilot. So everybody, including me and Greg, I, I'm going to be able to fly the thing for like five minutes because I'm just, my power to weight ratio isn't good enough. But um, we all have been taking sailplane training, um, in, uh, particularly important for the non-pilots, just so they can um, get some feel for what it's like to fly before they try to fly it. Uh, I mentioned that when those things all fell down and ripped, we had to redo all the cross bracing. It's, it heavily stretched the cross bracing. And in some cases, the cross bracing cut through the, um, the ribs themselves. So we had to do some extra patching on the ribs. So this is all of the Kevlar lined up and re ready for all of the nine wing sections that we have. Um, this is just showing, uh, lashing on some of the outer supports. I, I like this picture because it shows we've got young kids and retirees all working on this. this is an all volunteer project that we're just doing for fun and we've had you know men women children everybody working on it. it's been been a lot of fun uh, so we wanted I, I mentioned that we have this um, adhesive back mylar called Duralar that's two thousandths of an inch thick instead of half a thousandths on the front in order to make sure we have laminar flow but every 350 centimeters, it adds another two thirds of a kilogram to the airplane. And so we had a notion that um, at some point the laminar boundary layer is going to get thick enough that it's not going to transition at that lip and we can get rid of some of that weight. So we made a test section and we tried three different lengths and we covered it up with kerosene and lamp black and did a bunch of truck testing. But in the end, the results, we didn't, what you're supposed to see is a nice line somewhere where the transition is happening. And I, I think we did see a little bit of that in some earlier tests we did with another tail section, but we just didn't really see that here. And it was going to be too much time and fiddling to figure that out. So I just punted and, and picked the middle, um, the middle number. This is back to the repair. This is what it looked like when we were getting ready to repair. This is the broken. There used to be a support beam there. We had to cut it off at both ends. The company in New Zealand that's making our um, parts are a sailboat mass manufacturer. They made us a new custom one that was slightly smaller that would fit inside. And then we did an extra wrap on the outside of that to make it even thicker and stronger than the, it was before. Um, and then this is showing, <laughs> this is our patch kit and showing that, you know, most of the repairs were just a really simple um, little uh, extra doubler or a little patch on the, um, on the rib cap. This is a photo of the second propeller that we built. We've built propellers several different ways. These days, what we're doing is taking uh, a slightly heavier than two pound foam called spider foam, which you can't get anymore, but it's similar to the Dow, um, I'm forgetting the name, but there's a Dow foam that's meant for like putting refrigerators on that's really, really dense in one direction. Uh, and then we machined that with the four axis mill, um, making grooves for uh, prop spars and then, um, inlaying the prop spar in here and then sticking out a little bit to the outer section. And then the outer section is, gets too thin to have a circular spar inside. 
So we groove it on the outside and put an ex a, a pultruded carbon fiber strip most of the way close to the tip. And then that whole thing gets covered with a couple layers of um, 1.4 ounce fiberglass cloth. And then that gets sanded and painted. So the very first prop we did was a built up style prop with an aluminum spar, which is, works great, but it's heavy. And we decided to increase the span. We didn't increase the, the RPM enough, so we came up with this really behemoth cord blade. This one was made by cutting hot wire cutting out sections. You can see the sections here and gluing them together. And then eventually we ended up with the slightly denser blue foam, but this is about a quarter of the internal volume here. So even though it's denser foam, it's a lot lighter um, overall. And we got these down to about 480 grams per blade finished. What's your rotation speed? Um, I can't remember. I think it's... Uh, I think in cruise it's like 140, 145, depending on the weight of the pilot. And then when it's putting out full power, whatever we designed, defined it as 750 watts or something, it's about 175 RPM. Um, this shows our bending bath process for bending the, the uh, Depron leading edges. And then here people are putting on, we basically compromise and, and the, the adhesive back mylar doesn't go all the way to the back. It just goes most of the way to the back. So they're putting on um, the sheet. There's still the backing sheet on here. So when they pull that off, this will be clear and, and look like the Depron, just shinier. Uh, and then we use the Uhu pour to um, glue the Depron onto the ribs. Then we spent a bunch of time covering all nine wing sections. This is all after we did the load testing. So it starts off all wrinkly, tape it to the front, and then do an ironing process and get it pretty nice and smooth. It's a finished outer wing section or a, a wing extension. This is the trailer I was talking about. Um, it's 28 feet long on the top box for the longer wing sections. And then this holds all the other wing sections and tail sections. Um, we learned a lot about trailer design. Nobody has formulas for how to design trailers that we could find. There's just these rules of thumb. And our original design had the wheel too, too close to the center. And we got above about 40, 45 miles an hour. It had this severe sway. So we end up having to uh, grind all those, have the welder grind all the welds out and move it back a couple feet, and then it became reasonable. And this is showing the wings and, and wing sections. We designed it with not enough clearance, so it just barely clears, and that was one of the mistakes I made. I was trying to use standard material that's got four foot thickness, uh, you know, four foot height, so it's basically four foot by four foot cross section trailer to fit all the sections and. I would have done it a different way if I had to do it again. This is our test rig using our old original built up props to basically have pilots try it out and try out the drivetrain concept before we built it in carbon fiber. Uh, a photo of our um, seat frame. We were originally going to weld this and we did a bunch of TIG welding practice, but then it turned out the, the same lashing technique with Kevlar that we used on the, um, on the carbon fiber frame worked pretty well on the aluminum as well. And then this is sort of a, from an unusual angle, but we, when we built that pseudo fuselage for the load test, we registered that onto the wing when we, when we um, put it all together. Then the wing broke and we fixed it. And then we had to, we now had our rear and front wing mounts, you know, locked in place. And we had to use the real fuselage and register it off of those. So we hung it upside down and made sure it was really vertical and sort of put our our wing mounts. This is one of the two wing mounts. It's just a balsa block with end grain to take the compression of just the weight of the wings and then all of the load of the of the wing lifting with 2.5 G's plus a 5 X safety factor is taken up just in this Kevlar and then I put some put some X's in the middle just for good good luck. Um, so then in May we took it to we are basically getting close to being finished. We took it to Hiller Museum again and this time we're a live exhibit uh, just assembling the airplane upright with everything in place except for what was not finished. You can see these are going to be aluminum brackets that hold the wheels and those weren't done yet and we didn't have our fairing done and a couple other details. We, we tried a king post and out of carbon fiber but that was a bad idea. Um, so there's a few things, a few details that need to be fixed but it's basically the finished airplane. This gives you a sense of how, how big it is it's from corner to corner of this big atrium area that they have. This is the 37 meter version of the airplane. 
Uh, this is from upstairs. You're only seeing part of it. I mean, the wing extends way out there. Is that a full-size Catalina? No. Uh, I don't know what that is. Oh, no, that's, that's like a third or quarter scale model. This, this is some full... This is a, some full-size thing that was, I don't know, under the, an iceberg or something, or under a, a glacier. And they do have a bunch of really full-size airplanes. In the other room, they have this gigantic high-altitude drone from the 80s from Boeing. They have a half, like a 747 fuselage outside. They have a bunch of really cool stuff at this museum. If you ever make it to California in the Bay Area, it's worth visiting this museum. It's in San Carlos, uh, between San Francisco and San Jose. Um, this is just showing and explaining to kids what's going on. Uh, you can see the recumbent seating style and the, you know, we just have a simple twisted chain with an idler pulley assembly in the middle. There's a couple of panoramas taken to try to give an idea of the whole airplane in one shot. It's, it's, uh, it's hard to see. Um, and this is another strange panorama. I think, Greg, you took this one yeah. by lying down on your back. so. So he lied down on his back a little bit to one side of the fuselage, and that's the wing all the way over on this side, and the wing all the way over on the other side. Um, just looking at the idler pulley, we actually, that's one of the parts where we were still having some interference at the tip, so we're changing that design slightly before we fly. Those parts should be done when we get back in a, in a week. Um, Greg's trying to figure out where the handlebars are going to go, and I got some pictures of that in a minute. Uh, I just like this shot really shows the wing well. And then, like I said, the last few things we're finishing are the fuselage and the, the wheel brackets and the, uh, the handlebars and controls. So we built up the ribs the same way as I showed in Voltaire earlier, but you know our fuselage is a tapered fuselage, so we've got a bunch of different ribs. I actually designed this in CAD, but didn't leave enough room um, for the feet. And we found that out when we built it up and tried to you know, stick pedals or shoes on the pedals and stuff. So we had to redesign the bottom rib and the formers that go underneath and make them wider. So that was an iterative process. Uh, this was their first stab at um, handlebars. We decided to put the stick in the center and have handlebars on both sides. Since we're recumbent, handing out, hanging on the handlebars isn't as important as an upright one like Voltaire. And we, this way, a left, lefty or righty could fly it. Um, this was an idea for an armrest that we decided we didn't need. And the way that's built, it looks like it's a pilot impaling device or something. Um, so that's not going to be there. But what we found it w with this position, we did a bunch of testing and we thought we had a comfortable position, but when we actually got in there, it stuck our elbows out too far. So you'll see the next one is actually much more down like this to kind of bring the elbows in. Um, and that was just sort of test fitting with tape, but that whole thing is being built. I think it may be finished now um, and ready to use. And we've got a, a trim button set up here. We're using RC radio to control the tail. And then a, it's not a full size joystick, but it's bigger than a thumb joystick. So you can use a few fingers on it. Um, this just shows details of some of the ribs in place. The first couple, I think there's a third one up there that's off screen. And then this is how we built it. We put a plate at the right height and then just put the rib on and started doing a zigzag pattern. And then this is the trailing edge that's uh, now been glued into place. And we're working on the formers here, test fitting the shoes, making sure that everything's gonna clear. And then this whole thing's gonna get encased in, in mylar. And that's it. So. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes. yes. Alex, you have a lot of volunteers. Do you find they all come already knowing what to do, or do you find training a problem? Um, almost nobody knows what to do when they show up. There's a few people that are experienced aero modelers that, you know, can dive right in and do stuff. But, you know, a lot of the tasks are not that hard. So you just train people how to do it. And some people like it and some people don't. We've had over 300 people working on this airplane, which sounds like a lot. And um, what are you doing to entice these people? But, um, <laughs> well, we had, uh, it started out being mostly my friends at Google working on it. And then I did a bunch of talks about it. Um, we got alumni groups. There's a lot of different alumni groups in the Bay Area. 
um, came through and I did tours and we'd always have sign-ups for people to come by. Um, I've given talks at schools like Stanford and, and um, I gave a talk at West Point. Obviously none of the people from West Point volunteered, but most of these talks have been local. And so we just get people, and then, then people hear from people that have been working on it. Some of the people that work on it recruit their friends to come in. And out of those 300 people that have worked on it, it's you know, very much a Pareto curve, right? There's at one time a, a core group of half a dozen or a dozen people that are actually spending a fair amount of time on it. And then maybe another dozen people that come every so often. And then there's a lot of people out of those 300 that tried it once or twice and then never came back. So I, you know, we've been talking with some of you here about this, the problem of getting people that now want to volunteer to get up at three in the morning and help us fly it is going to be an interesting problem. Um, I think we have the advantage that we're in a less northerly location. So maybe we'll be getting up at 5.30 or 6 in the morning instead of 3 in the morning, and that may, may make a bit of a difference. Um, but, um, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been fun. I mean, the whole point of this thing has been sort of fun and, and education. And so my philosophy is just anybody should be able to build something on the airplane, and if they screw something up, we can always fix it. And so we just try to monitor what people are doing, correct things if they do th things wrong. And for the really critical stuff that we don't want to screw up the first time, we have more experienced people do that or, or carefully supervise other people that are, that are doing, doing it. Uh, did you have to be there all the time yourself? Or could you delegate? I am not, was not there all the time myself. For instance, all that fuselage work you saw at the end was, was Linda and um, Greg and Ron, a, a few people that are you know, that core half dozen people that are working on it, they continued it on while I was here working on Voltaire. Um, and, you know, so there's been several times where I've been gone on trips or whatever, and we still end up having build sessions. We try to have a regular schedule of three or four days a week. Um, and uh, that, you know, tends to work. It's been hard since we moved in November because we used to be up in Mountain View near Google, and we had a core people, of people built up there. And when we moved just I don't know, 12 miles south to San Jose because of the traffic, you know, the economy's heating up and traffic's really bad. It's a lot harder for people to get there. So we've lost a lot of people that used to be regulars, um, that, which has made the finishing it this last six months a little bit more of a challenge. When, when you weren't around, did you have to delegate responsibility to someone, someone else or did you just say, did you just say Yeah, I always had the, somebody in charge of the build session. So no. <coughs> Linda was in charge of doing the... Um, the, the last few weeks of working on the, the fuselage burning, for instance. When you had that failure, was it a rotation or what? I, I missed it. When yeah, failure. so what happened is our, our pseudo fuselage, as we call it, we made out of aluminum mm -hmm. for the test. We were only holding it on the forks on one, one position, mm -hmm. uh, you know, basically just on a big round four inch diameter tube. Yeah. And it was, you know, well balanced. We had it at the right angle attack the first day. We noticed later in the pictures that we'd let it shift a few degrees and we had this problem where slowly over time the fork was doing this. And so what happened is, because it was shifted a couple degrees over, so it was already over center a little bit, and then as the fork kept doing, uh, moving, it shifted over, and finally that moment was overcame the friction in the system and it just flipped really quickly. We only had one person, Ella, who was here last week, some of you may have seen her, she was the only person who, we, had, we must have had, what, 25 people there or something? We had 25 people there, and you saw that one picture where everybody's just kind of looking at it and talking. Everybody was like, the whole test was basically over. I was coming down the stairs to take the forklift down, and so nobody was paying attention. And she was looking at it, and she could describe exactly what happened. Because at first we thought, oh no, we had some structural failure that caused this. But it wasn't a structural failure, it was just brain fart in Alex brain for not retying that. Just uh, loss of control in pitch, basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So um, they had one, another big lesson we learned there is always, always videotape everything, not just flights, but tests, too. So we know now that we want to always have a video camera on. Hey, David, when you, when you tested your spot, did it have a tendency to want to rotate, too? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and that and the French had that problem, too. Well, in the, in the video of the, the gems, thing on, on Van Gogh's theory, you had the same problem where they were doing the test and the whole thing started to rotate around. So it's a, it's a known problem. <laughs> Fortunately, we, we took Bob's advice and we actually, um, you know, when we did this test, we designed the, 
length of the string so that most of the water bottles were just barely above the ground once we lifted it. We lifted it a minimum amount so that if it fell, it would fall the minimum amount. Um, but still, we added that twisting element in it that we weren't thinking about, which we're really, really lucky that the, that aluminum piece stuck onto the... I mean, you could see the little dent where it, it hit and stuck, and if that hadn't happened, if it had slipped by and gone through, we would have been completely rebuilding at least the middle wing section, if not all the wing. Well, yes. I it. You started off with um, aluminium spars and forming them on the rear slides. Oh yeah, yeah. So, right. So that was my retro plane yeah. idea. Right. I just talked about a couple different planes first. Um, last year here, I was. We'd been spent spent so much time building dash, and I was like, what can we do to build a plane in like three or four months that will fly? Yeah. Not as well as I'm hoping dash flies, but but I was trying to think of a completely different thing because the original Gossamer Condor one prototype, which was admittedly crude, they built in mm -hmm. in like yeah. a weekend, yeah. and so I was trying to think: is there some way that we could do something like that? that would actually, you know, be fun and work. And so I've been working on this sort of in, on the side, and then we came up with this grand idea that we would actually build parts, um, bring them over here at the start of July, and actually build something for BHPFC, but then Dash stretched out for a multitude of reasons, not just Dash-related, um, but family commitments and other stuff. So. Um, uh, it just, we, we got a lot of development work done on it, but we just didn't get enough of it done in time to actually try it this year. So we may try something like that next year. Yeah? And the lift wires you were talking about, were they cable or were they single strand wire? Sing, single strand, just a single like, piece like of 80 thousandths music wire. Like yeah. 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 Uh, not stainless, I don't think. I think it's just reg I think it's regular music wire, not stainless. Well, we got the last question. Yeah, in your shift from uh, using mylar, are you using polyolefin rather than mylar? Did you actually have any data on the Young's modulus, or did you uh, do any investigation into that? Well, on Dash, we're still using only mylar. Yeah, because we, my we, impression is that we've used both. My impression is the polyolefin is a lot easier to sort of stretch and make look nice. But I actually think it's Young's modulus is a lot lower, yeah. and therefore I would say in flight it won't be as good, uh, and it would deflect more, right. and not hold the shape. And that's why we've actually gone back to mylar, even though the mylar is more difficult. It d doesn't look quite as good, <laughs> but actually I think it's probably better. But it's, you know, I haven't... This is just a sort of come from gut feel. I yeah. haven't actually done I it. definitely think... I mean, have it, so we worked extensively with polyolefin these last two and a half weeks with Voltaire, yeah. uh, making all the wing um, repairs. Oh, I see. This is Voltaire. Well, Voltaire, we use polyolefin. polyolefin. Yeah. We actually use mylar on the the um, on the fuselage fairing for, for for Voltaire, but on the wing for Voltaire, it was all done in polyolefin already, right. and it had a few rib bays that were torn, and it had probably a third of the ribs had had pretty big delaminations we wanted to fix. Yeah. So we had to slit those and repair those. So we had a few areas where we actually patched with polyolefin, yeah. and then we re-shrunk the whole thing. And yeah. it shrinks really nice. I know it does. Um, it looks really nice. And it's nice. pretty easy to work is with. Is it as good? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think that mylar was the right choice for dash for the yeah. back open part of the panels. The question is, like, what is the most effective way? If you're going to use Depron for your leading edge, what's the most effective way to cover the Depron? And I don't know if we... We, we chose a somewhat heavy solution, um, and I'm not sure I would do it the same way this time. One way would be to, to use polyolefin, another way would be to use a much lighter... Do you remember the name of the film? Well, we, um, well I have uh, to say that we do the same as Airglow did, which is a 25 gram uh, glass fiber um, sheet. Yeah, that's where I got the idea for the yeah, R-dash uh, skin. It works really well. Yeah. We put it on the forward form leading edge. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of different ways to do it, and, yeah. and I picked maybe what the a heavier one than I should have. And we also have some problems with this adhesive back monitor that it bubbles up in a few yeah. places. So I'm not real happy with it, but it's going to work and it's just going to add a couple kilograms that we probably didn't need if we could have avoided it. When the flexion takes Okay, this is the real last question. The Wait. Um, University of uh, California wing that looked you see it was heavy in construction. What was its construction? What was making it heavy? The density of the phone? The carbon that they were adding? The thickness of there, I don't know if you saw in that picture, but yeah. there, um, 
their end plates were just huge. They built their own spar, and I, I and they did a bunch of testing. And um, uh, did you think they over? But spar? that that end cap probably weighs five times the the end rib on a dash. It's just way overbuilt with carbon fiber. And that's the wing is not is that, that bad. The wing is maybe like ten pounds heavy. Is it a tip cap or just a section cap? Uh, section cap. So, oh, yes. so this is only one of five sections. They, they independently came up with an almost identical wing plan form to ours, but the rest of their plane is a lot different. They had a, a uh, H tail, uh, which caused a lot of difficulties for various reasons. They had a really long um, uh, tail boom, then they had a sailplane like fuselage. So the rest of the airplane was totally different from ours, but the wing turned out to be almost exactly the same. But their construction techniques were a little bit heavier. But their tail was really heavy and the, the way they were going to build the um, fuselage was pretty heavy too. So it's just, you know, version 1.0 and I think the guys that are working on it now are, are reevaluating and, and going to, I don't think they're going to completely redo it, but I think they maybe are starting with the, the wing and trying to do something different with the tail and the fuselage. Did you develop your own wing section or did you? No, we used the, de the Daedalus section. Daedalus section. Yeah. Yeah. We weren't trying to reinvent everything, we are just building it for fun, so. Uh, the Daedalus section is very nearly something else, isn't it, like on the board? Or was it? Uh, very close to the Pierre Frank section. Yeah. yeah. So was it various sections varying along the span? Yeah, they start with the DAE 11 and it goes out to DAE 41 at the tip, and what you do is you just interpolate in between. For a different round. Yeah, as the Reynolds number gets smaller on the tip, the, the the, the um, shape changes. So basically, after the first two or three sections on the tapered section, every rib is slightly different, um, slightly different shape. All right, I'm uh, happy, I think we'll happy to answer more questions there. later. I think there'll be plenty of opportunity for discussion if you have more questions with Alec later on. In, in the bar. He doesn't have to worry too much about getting up early in the morning, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. Thank you.